And we are going to have our scripture reading and prayer. We do need the choir this morning. I also am going to need the choir tomorrow at 2 o'clock at the uh, funeral home for uh, the funeral for Joni May. And that's down here at Rogers. And if anybody could help us, I'd appreciate it very much. <clears throat> I'll read from Matthew 7, starting with verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this gathering here this morning, for everybody who made their way here to the services. I pray everyone will be blessed, and I pray, dear God, that you'll accept our worship and bless those of our number that are grieving because of the loss of a loved one. Also be with those who are confined either to a hospital or their own homes or a nursing home. We pray, dear God, that you'll reach out, help us, help them, help us to minister. And we're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ who brought us together here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll have our uh, special song.
morning. Our opening song is going to be 361, This World Is Not My Home. We'll do the uh, first, second, and fourth verse. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world. song is going to be 574 and if you are visiting with us today and are a Christian and wish to partake of communion with us and did not receive a communion packet as you came in if you will raise your hand one will be brought to your seat We'll do the first, second, and fourth verse of this song at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. No. Hey! 
morning. You know, for us old timers that's been in the church for many years, we've heard communion meditations one right after another. Floyd always calls it the Holy Communion when he, do, when he would do his communion. I picked up on that. We've all got our little quirks and things that we talk about when we do the communion. But I'm a little bit aggravated this morning about the communion. Every time I try to study, I keep seeing the Olympics and the drag queens there that were depicted as the Lord's Supper. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. I don't know whether to pray for them people or get mad at them. But Francis gave us an apology. Boom. <laughs> if they was going to apologize to start with, they shouldn't have never had it. So I'm still upset about it, but I guess I'll get over it. But I don't like anything that puts a dim light on my Savior. He gave his life for us, the perfect sacrifice. He had no sin. And I'm not going to listen to a bunch of drag queens and fruitcakes. I'm going to listen to what the good Lord says because I'm too old to turn back now. I don't want to miss the boat. It says in this life only, if we have hope in Christ, we're among men most miserable. We're looking for something in the hereafter that is better than what we got here. Because it also says man born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So I, since I've got that off my chest, I'll try to be more reverent and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. But now in Christ, in Christ risen, but now is Christ risen from the dead, and there came the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man come death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Through Adam all of us were born into sin. We're sinners. We've been forgiven, but we have to continue to pray and and take our problems to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even to the Father. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now Bob quoted this last night at the funeral home. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doeth corruption inherit incorruption. Our Lord was in the tomb for three days, but his body did not corrupt. Ours is going to rotten and go back to the dust. That's another difference between me and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's divine, I'm not. We got to reference him, or reverent him, or just quit and as we gather here this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper I'm mindful of his body that was everything that you could do to a body without breaking a bone in it they done it but it was prophesied that a bone wouldn't be broken in his body and every drop of blood he had was shed for us and I think it's a little bit time for us to come out of our shell and stand up and say, hey, I'm a Christian, and 
I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to see this nonsense every time we turn the TV on or the news or something. I'm myself sick of it. And I hope I haven't brought any reproach on here this morning for let, letting me get this off my chest. We have hope and the observance of the Lord's Supper also manifests that those who faithfully partake thereof have a lively hope that Jesus is coming again. Now that's what we're hoping for. And the love that he showed there. To observe the Lord's Supper is one of his commandments. Those who love him will obey him. He said you love uh, uh, this is one of the uh, things that he knows that we are abiding in him by we keep his commandments. And we love the brethren and the Holy Spirit beats us up when we do wrong. Those are three things that can let us know that we're Christians. And not only does the Lord's Supper proclaim the love of those who faithfully partake thereof, but also the tender love of the Savior who willingly died to redeem lost mankind. Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So I am getting over my aggravation, I guess. But I think it's time that we start standing up. I'm talking politically and spiritually too. Thank you. Bruce, I want to thank you for that meditation and for you standing up for God. But lots of times we won't do that, and that's the problem. And uh, I'm like you, I'm angry. I'm hurt over that and I think if we're a Christian here today and if we ain't hurt and angry over that we need to self examine ourselves and uh, but thanks Bruce okay if you now will prepare to take the Lord's holy communion as Lloyd would say and it is holy Amen. <clears throat> let me let us pray for the bread Dear Lord, Heavenly Father to God, we thank you, Father, for this day, and we are so thankful, dear Lord, for all the many blessings, Father, that you have given to each and every one of us, dear Lord, and dear God, we come to you, Father, with heavy hearts, dear Lord, we, for the love that we have for you, and also we, we know the sacrifice that you made for, for each and every one of us, and, and how special that was. And just pray, Father, that as we do take this bread, it represents your body. As our brothers, brother said, your, your body was beaten and cut and stabbed and spit upon and just all kinds of horrible things, dear Lord. And we know, Father, that you could have come off that cross at any time, dear Lord, but you didn't. You sacrificed yourself for us. So as we take this bread this morning, let us remember our precious body. In Jesus Christ's name. If you would, go ahead and prepare your cup. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, as we look upon this communion, Father, we do recognize the bread as being Jesus' body, and we recognize the cup as being his blood. Father, we know that Jesus is the, the author and finisher of our faith. Everything begins and ends with him. God, how thankful that we are 
that you loved your creation enough that you allowed your one and only son to be placed upon that cross to have nails that pierced his hands and feet that held him there to know, Father, the pain and agony that he, he suffered because of his love for you and your love for us. God, as we go through this week, I pray that you'll give us the strength we need to overcome the temptations in this world, to know you're always with us, that we know how much you love us by giving your only son. God, may we never take communion for granted that we always recognize the body and blood of our Savior and Father we thank you for your love, your mercy and your grace that you've shown to each one of us through your Son Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior it's in his name we pray Amen <coughs> We'll take a couple of minutes for personal reflection and prayer. said, well, we know he can't read music now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to scrub you off a song here. I am a poor wayfarer and stranger traveling
Jesus. He said he would meet me. Oh, when I call, I'm just going over Jordan. I'm just going. One of the books for your through the Bible reading in a year is Amos in the Old Testament. Amos the farmer prophet. Amos was not a professional prophet. They had schools of the prophets. That seems kind of strange, but um, Elijah, Elisha had schools for the prophets. And uh, they were supported uh, by gifts from the congregations of the Jewish people. However, Amos was a special prophet. Uh, he did not get money for his preaching as the other prophets did. He was a farmer. Also, he was sent uh, to a country that was getting ready to fall. Uh, at this time, Israel was divided in two, in two places. Uh, there was a civil war many years before that, after David's uh, son Absalom died. Absalom's son Rehoboam took over the country, but nobody liked him, and so they split. They had a northern kingdom, which became known as Israel, which took 10 of the 12 tribes. They also had a southern kingdom called Judah, which is just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, but they were the biggest because Judah was such a big tribe. Now, at this time in the history of Amos, Israel is getting ready to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians, a very cruel people. It's God's punishment on them. As soon as they got their first king, they never had, they never had one good king in their history, as far as loving God, doing God's will. The nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, Every king was wicked. The first thing that their first king did was Jeroboam the first, was to build calf idols for the people to worship. So this is a hundred years before the southern kingdom falls. Now in the southern kingdom, they had a little bit of an advantage. They had the temple. And as long as people go to church, things will do a lot better. So in the temple, that preserved them for another 100 years, but they too were taken to captivity. Amos had a message for the northern kingdom. They resented him, first of all, because they didn't think he was a real prophet. They resented him, secondly, because he came from the south and came north to preach. In other words, who are they to tell us what to do? I've been in programs before and missionary rallies and conventions and uh, even in different uh, venues. And, many, and sometimes they would have, especially at the missionary thing, they would have ministers from the mission field or even people who were converted by the missionaries who are now speakers. And I remember some of them coming, like maybe to chapel at KCC where we went to school, and 
they would be uh, of another nation. And they would come in and talk about how America is worldly and how America does not care about the people of the world. They're very materialistic. And I remember sitting there thinking, who are they to tell us when they have enough preaching for their own people to do? But you see, the truth is the truth, whether you're a national or a local. And they observe things a lot of times from other countries that we don't. Well, this is the same attitude that the leaders up north and the people up north felt about Amos. They didn't like Amos. He, and it's brought out in the scriptures, he came up north to tell them how to live. He was very scathing in his remarks. We noticed in the words of Bruce this morning uh, about the sacrilege against the Lord's Supper, about how uh, the world is getting more and more against Christ and Christ's people. And that will continue until he comes. There may be a revival that's happened before, but there may not. We see here that these people aren't listening to Amos. Now, the next step for all of this sacrilege that we see is when it comes in the church. We also see some denominations even in our area that have left their mainline denomination, became independent churches because of this very issue of homosexuality trying to be imposed not only on the culture but on churches. And it's going to continue. And at the temple of God, the big, beautiful temple that Solomon built, not long before it fell, they had living quarters for male and female prostitutes in the temple. Other prophets tell us this. Because they not only were worshiping Jehovah, the elders were also worshiping the sun, worshiping Baal, even one of the kings of the southern kingdom, and they were better than the northern kingdom, took one of his children on the wall of the Jerusalem temple and sacrificed him to Baal. It was coming into the church. It was coming in to the religion of the people. Now, you'll say, wonder what kind of religion they had then. Oh, it was beautiful. Oh, they had the sacrifices. They had the priests with their uh, very ornate clothing. That was Remember, we read about that in the scriptures, being commanded by God in the books of, uh, in the Old Testament books there of how God wants the priests to look good. And we see that they had beautiful singing. They had an orchestra, which was approved by God. They had singers, professional singers. They had incense, which God said, even commanded to be used in the worship. It really smelled good when you went in there. They had just about everything going for it, so here they were. They had a big, beautiful worship service to God upstairs, an evil and terrible living style downstairs. Now, Amos is reminding them that this is what they're like now. Uh, this is how you are. So he began to condemn Israel's sins, and not only condemn the sins, but warn them of Israel's destruction. 
The theme that I want you to think about as I get ready to close out here, yet you have not returned. Yet you have not returned. That's what God could be saying to America and some of the Christians in America. Yet you have not returned. Now, in chapter 4 of Amos, which I want to draw your attention to, God did some things to the people to make them think. He brought some calamities on the people. It seems like in America, calamity doesn't phase people. I mean, they don't like it when tornadoes and earthquakes and uh, uh, attacks from uh, from other nations come in and blow up our buildings. You know, it, they don't like it, but they never make a connection that maybe God is allowing it. That God is trying to tell us something. Well, these people were the same way. They didn't make the connection. I want you to notice uh, in Amos chapter 4, uh, starting with verse 6, God sent a famine. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, and you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Now, you're going to see that phrase, you have not returned to me, about five times here. I also withheld rain from you, and the harvest was still three months away. So we see, secondly, that he sent a drought. Not only did they not have food, which of course leads to the fact that uh, rain has not come. He said, I sent rain in one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. God also ruined the crops. Notice in verses 7 and 8. I already read seven. People staggered. This is verse eight. From one town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Didn't have enough water to drink. Yet, you have not returned to me. Many times I struck your gardens. Now notice here, in verse 9, the crops not only didn't have enough rain, but they ruined because of blight. Look now at verse number 9. The crops were ruined. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. They just didn't get it. They didn't make the connection. Then we see that there were plagues of sickness and also war. We've had our plagues of sickness for the last several years. And I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword. Along with your captured horses, I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me. He sent catastrophe upon them, different types of things. And we read this in verse 11. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So we went back to Sodom and Gomorrah, those two evil cities which had given themselves over to perverse homosexuality. I overthrew them, he said, and I even overthrew some of you as I did them. You were like a burning stick snatched from a fire, yet you did not return, you have not returned to me. Now, I want you to notice here as the words from verse 12 were put on the screen. 
I've seen these words before on homemade signs, maybe in front of an old church or maybe in front of somebody's house. It's a nice reminder for everybody. Prepare to meet your God. But I want you to notice something about this particular phrase in a moment. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. In verse 13, he who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. Their time had come. They were going to reap what they sowed. Prepare to meet your God may seem like saying, repent, change your ways. That's not what it means. It means it's too late. It's right on you. You've not changed. You won't change. They gave you a chance to change. You didn't. And I'm going to go through with the destruction that I told you was coming. You see, we looked at Jonah, the prophet. He was sent to the capital of the country to preach. The country of Assyria which was just getting ready within a few years to destroy these people, take them over. That's why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want his enemies to be saved. He didn't want uh, God to spare them. That's why he was mad and took the boat to Tar uh, instead of to Tarshish instead, and then had to be vomited up on the shore over there uh, near Nineveh, he didn't want to do it. And even after he preached, he was so surprised that at that time that they changed. Now, of course, this is later down the line. And the people changed in the city. Uh, Jonah was mad about that. We already discussed that one. But these people were very cruel. They had a horrific means of torture uh, to do to people. So God is saying, prepare to meet your God. In other words, I'm here. I'm ready. Uh, I'm going to go through with this right now. So when you hear the words, prepare to meet your God, it's already too late. You won't have time. It's like when the Lord Jesus comes for his second coming. You won't have any time to prepare. It'll be right there and then However he finds you is however, what state you're going to be in and determine where you and I go, heaven or hell. There won't be no time to change. So what are we going to do in our personal lives? Are we going to try to be faithful unto death as we are exhorted to do today? in the communion and the meditations and the words of the elders. Uh, I hope so. Remember, Jesus asked the question in the Gospels, when the Son of Man comes, he's talking about his second coming, uh, will he find faith on the earth? He'll probably find some churches, but will he find faith? That's, it, wasn't, it wasn't a matter, will there be a church of Christ in town? The question was, will there be any faith? We can be in a church of Christ and not have faith. We want faith because we know it's the basis of the beginning of the gospel plan of salvation. And everything stems from it. The Hebrew writer said, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
For they that cometh unto him must believe that he is and that he rewards them that diligently seek him. So there's going to be sadness and destruction for those who don't, but rewards and happiness for those who do. So we just need to be determined about what side we're going to be on. And as we're exhorted today to let others know. Jesus said the fields are white unto harvest. So that means that people are still, there's still somebody out there listening, wanting God and wanting Christ. You know, we may hear of all these horrible things that are going on and think, well, there must be nobody left. See, that's what Elijah thought with the prophets of Baal. Uh, he went a hiding after he had that uh, experience up on Mount Carmel, had a real good experience up there where he uh, destroyed all the prophets of Baal and the people started believing in God again. But he got one threat by one woman, and she was a bad one, Jezebel the queen, said, I'm going to kill Elijah. So he went to hiding, got in that cave. God told him to get out of the cave. He said, but I'm the only one left. God said, no, you're not. You're not the only one left. There are thousands more. And those times we think we're the only ones, we're really not. We just need to let people know what we believe, and then we'll find out there's some others that also believe. Maybe they're not far enough along uh, in their belief to be called a Christian yet. They may not have yet repented. They may not yet confessed the Lord. They may not have yet been baptized. They may not yet attend services and take the communion, give their money. But they may already have some faith. And we need to help people build upon the faith that they have. Because remember, Jesus said it just takes a little bit my sisters used to have those necklaces with a mustard seed in it, and it was in a magnified piece of glass. The mustard seed was so small that they would magnify it. You probably remember that. We said, that's all the faith you need. It doesn't mean that it's going to be enough forever every day, but it does mean it's a start so that you may grow in that faith. So let's, even as Christians, grow in our faith and in our conviction, and help others uh, to come to Christ as well. This morning, if you would like to be a part of God's family, uh, it's uh, just up to you. I mean, it, uh, it's not a matter of uh, are you smart enough, are you informed enough, uh, are, uh, do you have enough money? Uh, it has nothing to do with any of those qualifications. Did you, do you live in the right country? Do you live right in the neighborhood? It doesn't matter. And none of that counts. It's just whether or not you want it. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we read, whosoever will may come. Uh, if you're willing to come to Christ and haven't done so yet, then we want uh, you in our family because this is the Lord's church. And uh, we want us all together to go to heaven. I'd like for everybody to stand now. We're going to sing 600. Uh, Jesus is calling. He calls to the gospel. Uh, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. And if you believe that, uh, then you're on your way. Uh, and we just pray that you'll uh, make your calling and election sure and uh, obey the gospel today. So let's... Uh, sing verses 1 and 4, and I'll greet you down here if you wish to come. Mm -hmm. 